Good morning and Good happy morning. Sabbath. Um, I am teaching this morning. My name is Eve Knight, for those who don't know, and for those online who don't know. Um, let's go ahead and start with prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the promise that you're always where we gather in your name. And I ask that you would bless us, that you would bless our conversation, help us to understand your character better by the end of our time here. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, we're doing lesson 11, um, practicing supreme loyalty to Christ. So what is loyalty? How would you define it? Uh, to me, it's sort of a trustworthy relationship you have with somebody. Okay, very good. Trustworthy. Um, that's pretty close to what Merriam-Webster says. So she says that, um, I don't know if it's a she actually, but Miriam <laughs> makes me say that. Um, unswerving in allegiance or devotion, such as faithful in allegiance to one's lawful sovereign or government, faithful to a private person to whom faithfulness is due, so that trustworthiness, faithful to a cause, ideal, custom, institution, or product. So it appears that another word that could be used for loyalty would be faithful, right? Is it possible to be loyal or faithful to the wrong thing? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Can you think of some examples? Well, in the animal world, it'd be lemmings. <laughs> <laughs> they just follow who's ahead of them, wherever they're going. Down the cliff, off they all go. That's a good point. Um, you think of Hitler, for example. Did he have loyal followers? Yes. He did. Yep. How about David Koresh? Mm -hmm. Jim Jones. Yeah. Jim Jones. Yeah. What was wrong with the kind of loyalty displayed in those examples? It was misdirected. It was misdirected, yes. Absolutely was loyal to a person and a government instead of, and did not have God in their lives. Right. There, God was not involved. Anything else? It was <coughs> There was no like, thought that we might need to keep a slightly open mind to make sure we're going down the right pathway. Okay. That's getting closer. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was damaging to self. Mm -hmm. Definitely damaging to self. Kind of. <laughs> they surrendered their thinking to someone else. Is that what God, is that the kind of loyalty God wants of us? Is that what he asks? How do we know? Come let us reason together. Thank you. You are reading my notes. <laughs> Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1.18. So according to this verse, God wants us to stop thinking and just do what we're told. No. He wants us to come to him, converse with him, exercise our thinking through reasoning with him. So could a random stranger stand in front of us today and declare that we are all going to be loyal to him? Well, they could do that later. <clears throat> Would it actually happen? No. no. If they had a gun and they told us that they would shoot anybody who chose not to be loyal to them, would that cause loyalty in us? No. No. Why? It's it's fear. Because it's fear. And duress. And duress. Fear cannot create loyalty. It might create a temporary obedience, but not loyalty. Why? Where does loyalty come from? What is necessary for us to willingly choose to be loyal to someone? Trust. Yes. I missed that. Where does she said trust? Thank you. Where does trust come from? It takes time. <coughs> time to what? Time to, to, to have a new, have a relationship. Excellent. I like taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so it's one thing to read a recipe; it's another thing to taste the result of the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So you have to know the individual that you're going to choose to, to trust, to be loyal to, right? And that love and devotion grows out of that knowledge. Now, have, have you ever chosen to be loyal to somebody and then discovered that it was misplaced? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
So in the context of our lesson title, which says that we should be loyal to Christ, loyal to God, how does God gain our loyalty? By telling the truth, being who he is all the time, Mm -hmm. and by coming to earth to demonstrate who he is. Mm -hmm. It's hard to deal with with a, um, a situation where you've been lied about and you are powerless to do anything to change what that person is saying about you even though it's totally false. Mm -hmm. And if you ever get put in that position, you begin to comprehend the difficulty, God, why it's taking 6,000 years to answer every question everybody would have about his governance of the universe. Yeah, yeah. So if we go back to our lesson title, what does it mean to practice supreme loyalty to Christ. What does that look like? What does it mean to be supreme loyalty? Can you be partially loyal? Is that possible? I don't think, well, for a period of time you could be loyal and then you could become disloyal. So, I mean, that's a partial kind of thing. Uh, you really can't. You either are or you're not. But supreme loyalty, what is that? Nothing comes ahead of that. Exactly. It comes above everything else. So in everything that we're going to be studying today, I want to remind us that that always comes first. Our loyalty to Christ always comes first. So the lesson suggests that we could look at the overarching theme of supreme loyalty to Christ in Ephesians, and we're going to start with Ephesians 6, one, the first part of it. And it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Um, Now, a couple people uh, a few weeks ago asked me um, how I kind of study some of this stuff. And so I thought I would kind of share some of the process with you. Um, So I usually look at a lexicon. Um, I I like the one that's at BibleHub.com, just because it's easy and convenient. Um, I also have been known to use a concordance, which is... A little more challenging. Um, so if we look at this text in the lexicon, you can see on the left it has all of the words of the text, and on the in the middle it's the Greek word, which is you know Greek to us. And on the right, it's got the Strong's number. So this is Strong's concordance number, and then it tells you a little bit about what the word means. Um, And you'll notice that this word obey doesn't say obey on the right, does it? It doesn't. So if you're curious about that, which I was, you click on that blue number, and you get the next screen. This is a more in-depth definition, and it tells you how to pronounce it if you really want to. Um, But notice that it says listen to, attend to, hearken to, And then it says obey or answer. And interestingly enough, um, if you look at the bottom, it's an intensification of the simple verb to listen. So you're listening really well, attentively listening. So this word obey could be translated as attentively listening. Isn't that interesting? So let's think through the text and try to understand it a little better. First, is this uh, text just an arbitrary rule that children need to follow? Obey your parents or in the Lord for this is right. No. Hmm. How do we know it's not arbitrary? Because God's not arbitrary. Because God's not arbitrary. And it uses the word in the Lord. It has a conditional phrase. A little, yes. A little insert. It has an insert. In the Lord. How does that phrase alter the command? Because all parents are not doing what the Lord wants, they can be abusing their children. Mm -hmm. The children really don't need to obey them. They need to obey what they've learned at church, perhaps, or or by somebody who is a better Christian than their parents are. Right. So perhaps you could say that um, children are even children are to evaluate the advice and commands of the parents and then heed them as long as it doesn't go against the revealed will of God. Right? So if that's what they're doing, 
Um, it also says, for this is right. What does that part mean? Okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right to do that. It's okay to evaluate. It's okay to use our brains. As, as God told us, you know, come and reason together. Let us think about it. There may be another aspect in the sense that um, in this class we focus on the design law. Mm -hmm. And of course, as children, the design is that they're, they should pay attention to their parents. Yes. Why? Because they should be understood to have their very best interest at heart and always uh, the best. So I agree with you. There is a design law involved in this verse. Um, and perhaps if we look at the rest of the verse, we'll see a little bit closer what that design law is. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What does it mean to honor your parents? Respect. Thank you. Respect. That's exactly what I found when I looked it up in the lexicon. Um, now, granted, I uh, summarize it in that word. Because um, if you look at it, it says to fix a value or to fix a price, to assign value, to, to reverence. Um, and then, as it says, properly assign value or give honor as it reflects the personal esteem attached to it by the beholder. So notice this is in relationship. This is not just honoring outside of that. And I think part of the way we honor not only our parents, but God, our, our Heavenly Father, is by living an honorable life that is a credit to your family and to God. Yeah. That's how we give glory to God, is by showing the world what He's done inside us. Crazy, sick, lethally poisoned us. You know, we... Uh, we give him glory and honor because we show the result of his work. Yeah, very well said. Um, if we want to dig into what design law is actually in this verse, you'll notice that he says there's a direct result. He was actually, for the first time, 58 years old, slow learner, um, but for the first time in reading this, it's an invitation to begin other-centered love from the beginning. Yes. So, that again, so as we go into... It's an invitation to, to begin other-centered love as a child. Yes, it absolutely is. So let's think this through. It promises there is a desired result from this action, right? Which implies there's a design law involved that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So let's continue thinking it through. If children listen attentively to their parents, what will that teach them? A lot of wisdom instead of being lost in their own egotistical heads. <laughs> right? They can learn wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> what else do they learn? How does this help them grow? It helps them mature. It helps them mature. If children treat their parents with respect, what will that teach them? Respect for God. Respect for God? Respect for others. Respect for others. It also opens up a pathway to benefit from the wisdom of the ages. Because if you pause long enough to hear parents, grandparents, the stories, the, the nuggets of wisdom, wow, yeah, to get better. They don't necessarily have to make the same mistakes. <laughs> learn from the ones before them. Right? What is it, that saying that uh, wise people learn from the mistakes of others, normal people learn from their own mistakes, and fools never learn? <laughs> hey, not trying to step on any toes. I really believe in letting other people show you the landmines rather than you having to hit every single one yourself. Not just your parents, but otherwise people can say, you know, don't go there. That's what happened to me there. You know, avoid that. Mm -hmm. Kind of like showing you your way through the landmine of life. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, there's a story somebody told me of um, parents who had two children, boy and a girl. The boy was older. The, 
the boy was very precocious and very energetic and very determined. Mm -hmm. And they could tell him that he was to avoid touching something and he would try to touch it and he would get his hand smacked. And then he would try to touch it again and he would get his hand smacked. And again and smacked until his hand was just as red as could be and he still wanted to touch whatever that was. And his little sister would watch him getting smacked and leave whatever that was alone. <laughs> we can learn from others. We can learn from their mistakes. So if children evaluate what they hear from their parents in the light of God's word, what does that teach them? How does that help them grow? All the way. Are you catching on to the design law? Which one is it? Beholding. By beholding, we become changed. Law of worship. Uh, cool. For no. a child, I mean. For a child. For a child, the parent it takes, it's within the position of God to the child. Yes. That's why it's so important that the parent behave like God <laughs> to the child. But there are so many other design laws, too, because if you are actually listening and behaving, then you uh, enjoy more freedoms in life than mm -hmm. the frequent uh, restriction if if that seems to be what's needed to help one listen, understand, and... Yeah. So notice if the children are practicing listening and they are practicing treating their parents with respect, are they getting better at it? No. What's the law of exertion? You get better at what you practice. Mm -hmm. If they practice respect for their parents, they also learn how to treat others with respect. If they learn to listen to their parents, what kinds of things are they listening to and how does that help them in their future? What do parents tend to do? In theory, in a good home, they should be training, guiding, correcting. If the children are learning to listen to that, will that help them? Will they grow and get better at it? Will that help them in their future? It's really the ultimate social promotion. If you think about it, you know, when you get to when you get to uh, uh, formal classes and so on, you're supposed to actually learn the material <laughs> rather than just um, you know have the teacher like you and put you in the next grade next time. You know. Yeah. So yeah. You actually learn it. That's right invitation to parents and that is to lead with love the rod is needed but not as the first mechanism mm -hmm. to draw in to speak at moments when not over overextended as much it allowed better creativity to be able to sit down with and invite into learning and growing and building mm -hmm. that trust relationship from the beginning as well. So in a large part, parenting like God does. You know, the, whenever um, Tim said, I, I'm really sad for you that you have chosen to give up this privilege of having whatever the, the case may be, but the invitation to teach actions have consequences. Mm -hmm and to take it away from extra control factors to helping them build that centered locus of control mm -hmm. to them. Right. Parent, parents always have a better um, perspective on reality than just a total <laughs> stranger would have or somebody who does not love you. That's a good point. So if the children are learning these things, they're learning to listen, they're learning to attentively listen, not just listen and let it you know, slide past. If this is helping them in their future, and this can potentially help them have a better relationship with God, right? So if they're learning how to do this, they can also learn how to treat God that way. There's another design law that of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. 
If you treat people with respect, is your life more likely to go well, according to the text? Yeah. If you listen attentively to others, does that also mean that others tend to listen to you too? So, it has a probability, yes. But we do reap what we sow. So there's at least two design laws, as well as the law of worship that is, that is involved. So based on what we now understand about the text, it's Paul's advice to children about their outward behavior. No. No. What is it about? State of the heart. State of the heart. Thank you. Mm-hmm. About an attitude. An attitude that can be practiced. One that helps the child develop, grow, and have a more positive future. Now, I'm not saying that they're doing this on their own. They're doing this with the guidance of the parents. So is this an attitude that only children should practice? And whose guidance do we have? Even if it's something we didn't learn, even this is a hard attitude that we didn't learn as kids, it's still something that we can learn and practice now. So on Monday's lesson, Paul switches his advice from children to the parents. And we'll look at two different translations of the first part of the verse of Ephesians 6, 4. It says, fathers or parents, do not exasperate your children. And in the other translation, it says, do not provoke your children to anger. What does it mean to exasperate, or as the other translation said, to provoke to anger? What does that mean? Well, I, I, to, to me, it means being unreasonable, expecting the child to do more than they're really capable of doing, or thinking in a way that, it, you know, you should think like this, but they don't, the parent may do it un- unconsciously, not realizing a child's mind isn't an adult's mind. It doesn't have the capabilities. It doesn't have some of the things. Mm-hmm. It'll take until they're about eight years old to even get some of the through processes down, you know, and yet we're starting them earlier and earlier and earlier in school, mm-hmm. but we expect more of them sometimes than they're, they're even capable of doing. True. We expect perfection, <laughs> you know, uh, we want them to do it right, or sometimes um, I have a friend who would do everything for her kids, and I mean everything for them. As they got older, her husband and her kids, she did everything for them. And I, I talked to her a bit, and I said, you know, part of a parent is a teacher. Part of a parent is to teach them. You know, take care of them when they can't do it, teach them when they can, mm-hmm. and let them make mistakes. They may not clean the house perfectly. There may be spots here and there that they miss, mm-hmm. but that's okay because they're in a process. But if you, if you expect perfection early on, if you give a kid enough of that, they'll just give up. Like, fine, I'm not going to do anything that I can't ever please you. True. We have to remember their brains aren't done. Um, according to Arlene Taylor, their brains aren't done until close to 30. Um, still not done. And, and in some cases, still not done. So, um, sorry, sorry. So three elements on that. Uh, recently listening to a James Cleary interview with Brene Brown, and one of the, the things that uh, points he made is in building habits and how we approach life and all the rest. And how we, uh, uh, again, I'll speak from it. Anything you hear that's criticism, it's a it's self-assessment, not speaking to anyone else. Um, not speaking about anyone else. But he, he made the point of how we so often expect the first thing to be perfection versus, and then the self-talk, if that is not the level achieved, um, if not the first time, then at least by the second or third, right? Uh, but he made the point of, think of it as an acorn. When an acorn, an oak tree and the, the, the ready, and in its growing process, we don't look at the acorn and say, look at you, you're a pitiful oak tree, you know. Uh, or when it's starting to sprout and as a seedling, look at you, you're just underwhelming, you know. And all the, all the criticisms that, that one might say. We recognize that for where it is in its development, you're doing so well, you know. But we often don't give ourselves or others that grace. 
story from 20 something years ago of daughter in pre-k um uh, child care element but they had a little school and they were having their program and um uh children our children and it, it didn't necessarily go perfectly but it was great so when a daughter comes back, what do you, as an honest parent, not wanting to um, get say untruths, what does one say, right? So I'm um, hug and that was just so enjoyable. The lady in front of me with uh, um, a classmate um, it gave her daughter such a big hug and said, I especially liked when you and had a specific affirmation that was dead on honest, was able to bring that aspect of affirmation and able to let the rest just be what it is. Mm -hmm. And then if the individual asks for information, certainly that can be discussed later, but a specific honest affirmation I honestly struggle with that when children bring me drawings. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but yes. So finding one aspect. Yes. The color you used here, that color makes you smile. You can know. apply that to any type of teaching, to exactly. be honest, at any age. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So coming back to the text, um, the lexicon defines the word uh, to provoke to anger is basically one word. Um, it means from close beside and become angry. So in other words, it's properly rousing someone to anger to provoke in a way that really pushes someone's buttons. To really get to them in an up close and personal way because you are so near to them. Isn't that interesting? So have you ever known someone so well that you knew exactly what to say or do to get them angry? Or you knew the areas that were particularly painful that person and you could poke that spot with your words and cause a big blowout. Yeah. I have. I used to have a roommate who would clean every time she got angry. <laughs> you kept her angry, right? At least once a week. <laughs> Especially since she tended to clean the restroom. <laughs> that was pre-Christian days. Um, <laughs> but this is kind of what the text is pointing to. You know what they're like. You, you know how you can push their buttons. So how well do parents know their children? How easily can they push those buttons? Very easily, especially if they're not aware of it. They don't even realize they're doing it. I remember my mom used to say all the time, why can't you find that? It was right in front of you. <laughs> what she and I didn't realize, I'm not visual. I don't see stuff. And now it has become a joke, you know? But at the time, as a child, that hurt. But you get over it, eventually, right? But they can push those buttons. They don't even realize they're doing it. Hang on. Um, well, no, go ahead. Keep going, because I can, I can wait. OK. Um, but Paul says specifically to parents that they need to avoid doing this. So let's think about it for a second. If you were the child being provoked in this way, would your relationship with that parent get better or worse? It gets worse. What reaction would it cause in you? Rebellion. Rebellion. Perhaps withdrawal. Anger towards self. Anger towards self. Distrustful. Self-protective. Self-esteem. Loss of self-esteem? Mm. Would this type of response teach you to be more Christ-like and loving towards others, or would it teach you to be more like the world, practicing its method of survival of the fittest? Mm -hmm. Would you begin to think God was like your parent, especially if the parent was claiming to be a Christian? And how would that impact your desire to know God? So now imagine that you're the parent and you're practicing this behavior. What is that practice doing to you? <clears throat> is it making you more Christ-like to treat your child in this way or is it moving you away from God? 
Do you see why he would tell them to avoid this? People who purposefully provoke children, instead of being sensitive to their needs, are hardening their own hearts, which could eventually lead to abusing them in other ways. And abuse impacts both parties when it comes to having a good relationship with God. So in this type of abuse scenario that we've sort of shifted into, I'm not saying that the child and parent can't get to know God. I'm saying there are roadblocks for both. <coughs> the child has to overcome pain, injury, low self-esteem, shame, an inability to trust, and fear of authority of a figures, which is not an exhaustive list, but their conscience hasn't been seared. Their roadblock isn't quite as large. The parent has to overcome the searing of their own conscience from the choices they've made, which makes it harder for them to respond to, to God. It's not impossible, but it is harder. Now, is all of this something that only parents need to be careful about? All of us. In fact, if we think about the bus buttons that get pushed, do you know what your buttons are? Some of them. Some of them. Do you know what happens when somebody pushes them? It's usually not a good thing, right? Can you learn to control the reactions that you have when somebody pushes those buttons? Can you even learn to control it when they don't know that's what they're doing? Or that you don't know you had that button. Or you don't know that you had that button. So I can tell you, um, in my past experience at work, um, I had somebody who micromanaged me significantly. And that became a button. And when somebody starts to delve into what I do and tell me how to do my job, I can get very defensive very quickly. That's a button. I've had to become aware of it and go, okay, that's my button. They're not aware they're doing it. I don't need to react with, you know, flaying them alive or <laughs> anything else that comes to mind. How tempting it may be. <laughs> no matter how tempting it may be. <laughs> so you have to be aware of those buttons. Um, did you? There, and I can, somewhere in this thought process, and it can wait until uh, the end, but to circle back. Okay. Eve, um, I read a book, <laughs> and, and I don't remember the name of it right now, but a very helpful book, and it said, when we're like at zero, normally functioning, and then within 60 seconds, we are red hot on fire, that should be a, a flag waving that there is maybe an unhealed abscess of area inside you. Yes. The person that's triggering that didn't cause that abscess. They're merely scratching it. Mm. And it should be a trigger to say to you, something is unhealed inside me. I need to do more research. I need to come to the Lord. We need to dig that ab abscess out. Instead of lashing out at the person who's scratching, although I think you can say to the person who's scratching, this is a tender point for me. It's not because of you, but mm -hmm. you're scratching it. <laughs> you're, you're irritating my area. And, and let them know. I think it's okay to let people know that you found a real tender spot in me. <laughs> I'm going to work on that. But if you love me, if you care about me, please don't scratch that. <laughs> you know, if at all possible. Yeah. While I, I work on getting that healed. Very well said. Thank you. How easy is it for us to hurt those who are closest to us? And if you think about it, this involves parents, spouses, children, friends, coworkers. Anyone that we know well, we know how to hurt. So the warning is for us too, and it follows the same design law, the law of exertion. So I remember a story that was told about a high school basketball coach and his son. They had been outside practicing when the father received a phone call and went inside. The son, who was a little bit tired by this time, started just tossing the ball at the net, just without much care. Didn't care if he made a basket, he was just throwing the ball around. When the father returned, he watched his son for a moment and then simply said, be careful, son, what you practice is what you get better at. He was practicing missing. 
So every time we practice something, we get better at it. If it's complaining, we get better at that. If it's gossiping, we get better at that. If it's being negative in our speech or our thoughts, we get better at that. It's also true that if we practice the better things, we get better at those too. So if we look at what the rest of what Paul said in his advice to, his parent, to the parents, we can find a little bit more of the better things, right? So the rest of the text says, and I've got again two translations, instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And in the other translation, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So notice Paul is contrasting these two things, you know, avoid this, do this. And we're going to look at the phrases that Paul uses here. The first phrase, um, and I've just kind of summarized some of the information from the lexicon, says, bring them up in, which means to bring up to maturity, to nourish, to nurture. What does it mean to nurture or nourish a child? To feed positively. Uh, it doesn't mean everything's all fluffy, but to assure that what we are engaging in um, encourages growth, does not wilt, does not wither intentionally, but encourages that positive growth. Well said. We find the thing, the positive thing, and reinforce the positive. Sometimes growth involves pruning, too, and a little training of a, of a plant. But, but emphasis on the positive. Exactly. Absolutely. And any engagement is with their best good in mind. The, um, as we're getting out of the reactivity element, you need to preserve the, the will because that's what gets you through life. Exactly. You need a strong will. Exactly. And so that, I think, also is where the specific feedback, affirmation, or when you said this, it made me concerned. Because sometimes with individuals, or if that's happened to me before, this may have been what's going on. It has the potential for so the, the path of discipleship as far as training, mm -hmm. as far as possible engaging. Back with the, the um, feedback and buttons, way too often, and again, it's often seen only in the rearview mirror or with others, is that one's reactivity to another says more about the individual saying the criticism and their soft spots and their triggers as it does about the individual being criticized. Mm -hmm. Tim's thing about the big adult, the little five-year-old child, the adults ringing them out, and, and anyone seeing it is appropriately coming to the conclusion, one, you know, concern about child safety, but the person's got problems, or the adult, versus the child having it received as focused criticism of self right, mm -hmm. and taking it personally. But it says more about the individual speaking it. Absolutely. So often when if someone's pushing my buttons, it gives opportunity to hold up a mirror and say, where is that soft spot? As well as if I'm reacting to someone else and making a criticism, what does it say about what's going on internally? So if you've got a micromanager, what does it say about that? Yes. Usually that's a lack of trust. Usually they don't trust that you're going to do it the way they would do it or the way it should be done. And so they will watch you like a hawk mm -hmm. <laughs> to catch every, everything that isn't up to what they think it should, the way they think it should be done. Yes. Um, we're going to move on to the next section, training discipline. Um, again, in the lexicon, training and education of children, instruction, chastisement, correction, properly instruction that trains someone to reach full development or maturity. What does it mean to discipline? Disciple. To disciple, thank you. To provide opportunities to learn and grow, to teach ways and methods, even to learn how to, about how to think things through. When necessary, it also involves correction. And what does a child learn when they are corrected? 
hopefully. It depends on how they're corrected. Right. And it, and it depends on the child. I mean, I have two very different children, and like Rachel was saying, I mean, you don't want to destroy their will. Sometimes their will is very strongly against what you're wanting them to do. And, and you know, it's a real challenge to figure out a way to discipline a very strong-willed person who wants to run the whole house when they're three. <laughs> right. But you do. I, I totally agree that you do want to find a way to do that that, that keeps their will intact. It doesn't break their will, but somehow helps to, you know, sort of get the will, get their, keep them in the safe zones as best that you can. Choose your battles. Yeah. So often we come down to dichotomous options of it's a yes or no. I told you not to touch that versus something else. Again, I wish I'd known and implemented so much more consistently, but <coughs> given choices uh, yeah. instead mm -hmm. of the barrier of a no. So do you want to put on the pink top or the green one today? Do you yeah. want to? And have it be like flowing water mm -hmm. of being able to choose and work around. Yep. Yeah. Um, this just popped into my head, but um, Arlene Taylor, when she's talking about how our brains work and specifically how children's brains work, as we do not process the word no very well or don't. So if I tell you, and just think about this, if I tell you, don't touch the hot stove, what picture just showed up in your mind? Touching the hot stove. Touching the hot stove. If I tell you, keep your hands away from the stove, what picture just showed up in your mind? Mm -hmm. Keeping your hands away from the stove. So she tells a story about her son um, and his daughter, and she went to visit them, and the daughter came running out, and he said, don't run into the street. She ran right into the street. So Arlene had a conversation. She said, remember, positive commands are much more easy to obey. If you want her to stop, tell her to stop at the curb. Or stay in the yard. Or stay in the yard. Positive commands, um, positive reinforcement, these things our brain understands better. That's a little aside. And that um, goes for us too. It does. Um, I, I don't forget to do this. Mm. Uh, you know, and the, the don't is so that you're left with forget to do this. Yep. <laughs> yes. Quite a large says remember exactly rather than don't do this and don't do that. Remember, yeah. Um, that's, you know, if I have to remember to take something, I avoid the previous phrasing, remember to take that with you, remember to take that with you, remember to take that with you. Instead of don't. Huh? Instead of don't. <laughs> All right, so if a parent corrects a child, potentially, does the child learn to recognize harmful behavior? Do they also potentially learn how to soften their heart in response to correction? Can they learn how to make things right in a relationship by repairing what they hurt by their behavior? And can these things benefit the child both in the moment and in their growth and maturity? Can they also benefit the child in their relationship with God? Absolutely. So let me move on to the next phrase, instruction, which means admonition, warning, counsel. Warning through teaching. It improves a person's reasoning so they can reach God's solution, for example, by going through his thought process. Isn't that interesting? So what does it mean to provide instruction of the Lord? <laughs> Teaching his word, his methods, his design, learning how he sees people. Why he tells so many stories. <laughs> Why he tells so many stories. Embodying them enough so that they are demonstrated in one's life. Mm-hmm. So in all three of these things, these phrases that we looked at, did you notice a common theme in these definitions? And they should all three be up on the screen. <laughs> so do you notice the theme there? What they all seem to involve somehow? First first word that jumps out at me is maturity. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Maturity. And what is biblical perfection? 
maturity. And think of how this alters how we think of the text. The goal of the parent is to help their child grow up, think for themselves, and become mature adults who choose to practice God's ways and methods and have his law written on their hearts and minds. And again, is this advice only for parents? No. So first, let's think about how this would apply to us personally. Do we have a responsibility to nurture ourselves? To be committed to learning and growing in both the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What would that look like? Could it include being careful about how we think about ourselves as well as how we think about others? Learning to see who we are in Christ. Overcoming negative thought patterns that we have all learned and replacing them with truth. And how do we learn the truth? Consider what happens to many who are abused. They often are emotionally stuck at the age of abuse. So can that person provide what Paul is suggesting to their own inner child so that they can mature emotionally, potentially with help? And can those who haven't experienced abuse assist by speaking truth and encouraging maturity? And those who have experienced it and healed can do the same. Then how does it apply to how we treat others? Is it enough to just avoid hurting those around us? Compassion. Compassion. We all have a sphere of influence. Can we be the kind of people who nurture those around us and find ways to help them grow in maturity as well? Are there texts that come to mind regarding how we should practice treating others? Do unto others as you would have them. Not do unto others before they do unto you. It's actually the first one in my notes. Yeah. So then in everything, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the essence of the law and the writings of the prophets. You were reading my notes. (laughs) Other texts that come to mind. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And I had somebody tell me, even if something is true, does it necessarily build others up? You have to think about it. Another verse, therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. And, yeah, it's up there. So then we must always aim at those things that bring peace and that help strengthen one another. Ephesians 4, 2 to 3, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Therefore, oh, this text is this. This is Colossians. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Ephesians 4. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. And John 13:35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So what are some of the pitfalls to being able to treat others well? Not loving oneself. Not loving oneself. We, people who, who study uh, religion or... or uh, what God's will is, or whatever, sort of develop what they think of as sort of a ground level. I can accept this, but anything below that, I can't accept. And so, one of the things that I really like about this class is that I've come to understand that Christ actually died to preserve free agency in human beings, even if they don't 
fully agree or come up to my standards. So that's that's the point at which we should still have compassion or or um, understanding for others because they've been on a different path. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy that, that has worked with me a lot who uh, a plumber told me, he said, if you could see how that guy was raised, he said, you'd be amazed at how well he has turned out. <clears throat> and I know for a fact from everything he's told me over time that that is absolutely true. And so when, when it comes to um, understanding where a person is, there's a lot that goes into that. There is. I read a list one time and it said, when you're talking to somebody, you should run these three things through your mind. Is it true? Is it kind? Yeah. Is it necessary? And useful. Lori Gottlieb. In fact, I was just pulling up a note uh, on, on that as well. Um, there's a, the book is, maybe you should talk to someone. Um, and it is a therapist who also uh, um, approaches it from being the patient, going to therapy, as well as being the therapist working with other uh, other clients and individuals, mm -hmm. and so is it is it kind? Is it true? Is it useful? Uh, is her recommendation for self talk especially, mm -hmm. and then also when we engage with others? Mm -hmm. so. How do our emotions how affect how we treat others? If I'm angry about something, am I more likely to treat somebody well or not? And how much does it really matter how we treat others? Huge. It's a huge deal. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory. <coughs> it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them, that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. Amen. Wow. And if we approach that everyone is doing their best, this moment now with where they are, if we approach it as they're doing their best. If it's a pretty awful situation. Okay, so the, um, the discussion with some patients with being in toxic situations, especially the summer and some clinicals, and it's kids, and they have been in pretty awful situations. And so then the discussion about the adult, the kid, and if you saw them, what would you think? So that it helps to give that perspective the things that they've heard and the toxicity that's been thrown at them says more about the other person than themselves to help give perspective. Mm -hmm. But then the other part of that is, so with that being the case, what do you think that person that's spewing toxicity at you may have gone through in their life to get that way? We don't know. <coughs> we don't know. So if we approach it as they're doing their best now, allows him for compassion. It does. And we have to remember what he says. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. But how does any of this connect to the theme for the lesson this week of practicing supreme loyalty to God? Because God is love. Because God is love. He wants us to treat others with respect. He wants us to attentively listen to them. And we're all his children. We're Brothers all his children. And sisters, you know. Absolutely. Can we treat people well <coughs> even when we disagree with them? Can we treat them well even if they are criticizing us? Can we treat them well even if they are actively trying to cause us harm? Can we reflect God's character to those around us, thus demonstrating our loyalty to him? And would that, in fact, be a supreme loyalty? because it is not contingent on circumstances or on what others do, but on staying true to God. And can we do any of this without the Lord working in us and through us? 
it is our job to cooperate with him to make the choices. And then he provides the power and changes our characters. It's our privilege and our honor and the invitation to relationship. It is. It is a relationship that we learn and grow. And as we exercise those choices, we become more mature. So on Tuesday's lesson, we've got five minutes. <coughs> um, we move into the text, um, Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So I'm going to move fairly quickly through this. Slavery was pretty common during Paul's time and in the culture that he lived in. Some were sold into slavery, some sold themselves in into slavery as bond servants until they could pay off their debt. In the lesson, it says, what can we learn as we watch Paul value the, apply the values of the gospel to the flawed social structures of his day? Was Paul trying to apply the gospel to the social structures? No. Can you apply the gospel to social structures? No. The reason, what is the power of the gospel? Paul says in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentiles. The gospel is applied where? In the hearts and minds of individuals. What is the danger of trying to apply the gospel to social structures? Satan's methods. Thank you. Coercion. Coercion. We end up using Satan's methods to try to do good. Can we actually do God's work using Satan's methods? No. No. So let's go back to the verse. Notice where the advice is directed first. To the slaves. To the slaves. We can presume these slaves are believers because they're listening to this letter from Paul. Is his advice concerned about their outward behavior? Yeah. Respect I mean, it, it plays out in their life. Respect and fear is a state of heart. It's a state of heart. The heart, the actions flow. God says, with sincerity of heart. Exactly. Mm-hmm. He is, when he says obey, it's the same word. Attentively listen to. He gives them, I think, the same clause, just as you would Christ. So, mm, lost my spot. The, the word obey, attentively listen to. And he says, basically, with respect, which is familiar, because it's the same advice that we just looked at for children. And it's based on the same design laws, the law of exertion and the law of sowing and reaping. Do you think it would benefit the slave to be known as one who listens well and respect his master? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although, we, although we are not slaves, how could it benefit us to have a similar attitude towards those who might have authority in us over so, in some way? It, tr- it engenders their trust. Yeah. Uh, I think of Joseph all the time when bad things happened in my life. He was turned into a slave against his will, but while he was there, his master so trusted him, he could not think about anything except for what he was eating. Mm-hmm. And then he left everything. And then when he was put in prison, oddly enough, the prison was in the captain of the guard's area, and Potiphar was the captain of the guard. So when he got to prison, Potiphar made him head of the prison. Because he knew, since he couldn't use him in his own Mm -hmm. territory, and I think that's what he was more angry about, what his wife did to mess up his situation, than he was about Mm -hmm. the possibility that he would have been advancing toward his wife. I I think if he really believed him, he would have killed him, had him killed. But he trusted him with his whole estate, and when he had to do something, so he put him in prison and entrusted him with the prison. Mm -hmm. And that's all as a slave. Yeah, now you're ahead of me. And my notes, but yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't remember that. Um, but would this apply? Like, how many people would this apply to? Our bosses? Um, 
What about other people in positions of authority? Police? Emergency personnel? And I might be stepping on some toes. Store managers? Whether we agree with them or not, can we still cultivate an attitude of respect for all of them? The phrase sincerity of heart can also be translated as simplicity, purity, graciousness, singleness of mind, or single focus. Oh, Donna. If, if we um, have the attitude of helping them be successful, mm -hmm. okay, whether we're an employee or a slave or, or whatever, mm -hmm. what is what do we need to do to help them be successful? Because yeah. that's, that's their goal, is to be successful in whatever their endeavor is. So if we take the attitude, I'm here to help you be successful. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I am a little bit over time. Um, just forgive me just a few minutes. If the attitude of the slave is single focused, and we have that attitude, can that help us in our own work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you ever had a hard time focusing on a task? <laughs> and I have to admit it didn't occur to me until I studied this that I could ask God to help me focus. We also notice that the attitude of the slave is not just while he's being watched, but all the time. Which means that they're avoiding a resentful attitude, which is what you tend to create if you're just obeying while you're being watched, and instead developing an attitude of integrity. And how would an attitude of integrity benefit the slave in Paul's day and us in ours? Mm -hmm. The word wholeheartedly can be translated as goodwill, kindliness, and enthusiasm. And Paul directs them to work in all things as if serving the Lord. Why would Paul give them these suggestions? Would the result, what would be the result of a slave who worked in this way? Money look, be looked on favorably. And we have certainly good examples in Joseph, so we can skip that part of my notes. <laughs> and how does working like this change the individual? How does it impact the character? Where is this person's loyalty ultimately? And does this kind of attitude depend at all on the character of the earthly master? It does not. Whose character are we responsible for? Our own. It is our choices, our thoughts and actions that build a character more like Christ or more, more like Satan. God promises to prompt and guide and provide the power, but it is always our choice. Uh, probably don't have time to go into the, uh, the master portion, um, but I do want to point out that it says masters are to treat their slaves in the same way. The same as everything already told. They're told to treat them with respect, looking out for their good, treating them with integrity and sincere hearts as if they were serving Christ. They're also told to avoid threatening their slaves because this would be moving into Satan's methods. They're also told that the master and the slave both have the same master, meaning that in God's eyes, we are all equal. This is how he sees us. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And as the masters needed to be careful how they thought of their slaves, so too we should be careful how we think about and treat other people. We want to practice God's methods with his power. Loyalty to God, which comes because we love him, changes how we view others because he is changing us, writing his laws into our hearts and minds. When our hearts are changed, our actions follow. And as Jesus said in John, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for revealing your character to us. And I ask that you would restore and heal us back into, into your design and grow your character in us until we are mature people who can speak for you. In your name we pray. Amen.